Okay. Okay. So we're on slide 495, in case you're wondering. Uh, <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we talk about this, uh, the law, etc. Uh, we want to sort of slightly adjust the, the, the expression or the, the, the uh, categorization of the law here to uh, be, first of all, the first use of the law we're going to refer to that as the kind of pedagogical use of the law or the use of the law as a teacher. Uh, and so when it's used pedagogically as a teacher, it drives people to Christ by inciting and exposing their sin and threatening punishment on the sin. So that's the pedagogical use of uh, the law. Uh, <clears throat> all you have to do is tell your child not to do something and immediately they want to do it. <laughs> well, that's the pedagogical use of the law. It brings out our deepest, most secret inclinations of disobedience and rebellion. And, uh, and that's what the law of God, that's the pedagogical use of the law. It, it, it incites within us a, a rebelliousness. Uh, and thus exposes the heart for what it really is. And the law gives us the standard that we fall short of, and the standard is the basis for judgment. So judgment for failure to be able to keep the law is uh, the, what the law is trying to teach us. Secondly, we can talk about the law not only pedagogically, but we can talk about it as a as having a kind of community or communal function or use. Uh, and that's when we use it collectively or corporately to restrain the sinful act of men uh, in society and in the community. Uh, and that's sometimes associated with the with the threat of external punishment or discipline. So if somebody uh, you know, steals your car, then they go to jail, hopefully, <laughs> uh, or something else happens to them. And so we would say that that's the communal or civil application of the law. And then thirdly, the third use of the law we're going to call the normative use of the law, and that's the use of the law as a guide for Christian ethics, uh, the use of the law as a guide for Christian ethics ethics for faithful Christians. And so, so if we focus our attention on that third use of the law, its normative use, if you will, uh, uh, it's uh, helpful to study, to do that when you uh, think about the law in terms of the gospel and Christian ethics, the gospel and Christian ethics. Because the normative use of the law uh, applies the law in a way that we've been talking about it all along since we started, namely as the revelation of God's will for Christian living. Because uh, uh, John Frame's book on ethics is not accidentally titled the doctrine of the Christian life. <laughs> and so ethics is really about Christian living. What does it mean to live uh, uh, under the Lordship of Christ as you confront various choice options in your life? And uh, this, uh, it, this is the life we're called to live. So ethics isn't something, something just an academic topic. It's really a topic of how to live. And so it's kind of like the household rules that your parents make you keep uh, and that you uh, follow or you obey because you, uh, well, at least ideally, you love your parents and you trust them. Now, of course, growing up, you begin to question love. You begin to mistrust, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean none of you do, but... That I did, and uh, and anyway, so for example, if you listen to the words of First John three verse four, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawless 
darkness. And John uh, wrote those words long after Jesus had left the earth and gone to heaven. Uh, yet he asserts that the law is the standard for behavior. Lawlessness would be a behavior not becoming of a follower of Christ. And so sin is by definition breaking the law of God. And so law is still the standard of Christian behavior. Uh, it's the judgment between the righteous and the sinful. Righteous living and sinful living is determined by the law of God. And uh, a lot of passages indicate that when the law is used as that standard for Christian living or Christian behavior, it is not incompatible with the gospel. Okay? It's not incompatible with the gospel. In fact, it's perfectly compatible with the gospel. Uh, because in the scriptures, uh, Christians are not under the law in the sense that they are condemned by it. We're not under the law in the sense we're condemned by it. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not defeated by the law. Uh, rather, being under the law for the Christian in the New Testament is being, uh, is being a person who now has the capacity through obedience to receive the blessings of the law. The blessings of the law. And so, so, uh, so we are... Uh, in obeying the law, we are the approved of God. And the approval of God is just another way of saying the blessed of God or the approved of God. And when we receive His approval, it's like He's saying, well done, well done. And there's, a, there's an encouragement that comes with that, uh, that because of my grace, you're able to please me and to obey me and to glorify me. And that is... a uh, that's a good thing, and it's meant to have an existential impact in your life to know that God places approval upon those decisions that are pleasing to Him and that are consistent with His expressed will. James says in 1.25, he says, The man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. So it isn't, uh, it, it, it's not simply knowing it, but doing it, you're blessed by that. You're blessed by that law, uh, uh, doing that law. Uh, and not blessed, or not blessed according to the world's measurement of blessing, uh, but by God's measurement of blessing. So in the, uh, in the legal system of the Bible, there are a great number of laws and requirements. And in fact, they're so numerous uh, and they touch on so many matters that they're, they're, sometimes when you're reading them, you sometimes feel like there may be some conflict there. There appears to be some kind of a conflict between some of these things. And uh, a conflict between rules is a problem that every rule-oriented ethical system confronts. Anytime you have rules as part of your ethical system, you're going to have the experience of tension between rules, tension between uh, certain commands, if you will. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're real contradictions. They're not real contradictions. Uh, because God's laws never actually contradict themselves. Uh, because they are expressions of his character, and his character never contradicts itself. And so his rules don't contradict themselves. Rather, the scripture shows us a harmonious picture of all the laws of God within God himself. And because the law is unified and harmonious, uh, its commands are collectively requisite for obedience. So there's a collective a requirement of the laws, all of the law, for true obedience. So whether your actions are in true agreement with any particular stipulation of the law, they are in agreement with the whole of the law. So whenever it appears that a certain law in Scripture contradicts another, it really means, uh, it means that we haven't really understood it properly. We haven't come to understand the law properly and that's that may happen sometimes it may happen to you or 
whatever, and uh, that isn't a point at which you go, see, see, it must just, this doesn't work together, it doesn't fit together at all. Uh, the, the problem isn't the laws, the problem is me, and so I have to re rethink myself, what am I doing, what am I expecting, what am I looking for, and so we'll never understand the law perfectly, we'll never understand the law perfectly, uh, and so we're always going to face the opportunity and the tension sometimes between laws as part of being a finite people, finite creatures. We don't know everything exhaustively, only God knows everything exhaustively. So the real question then is what do we do when we face with these tensions within the rules? Uh, uh, but we could probably spend a long time talking about this, but we, we're just going to mention a couple, a couple. Uh, in the first place, God's laws are given uh, with the implicit understanding that at times some laws take priority over other laws. At some points, some laws take priority over other laws. So, for example, in Matthew 5, Jesus gives this instruction. He says, if you're offering your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Uh, in other words, you're supposed to present your gift. That's, a, that's a, a, a legal obligation. But then this other obligation takes precedence over that so that if you simply ignore the, the more important issue, then the gift that you give to you leave at the altar is not going to be pleasing to God. It's not satisfying uh, to God because reconciliation between uh, the people of God takes precedence over offerings made to God. And so, so much so, in fact, that if a believer is at the altar ready to present his gift, uh, he should wait, delay doing it until he's made things right with his brother. So how many of us take the Lord's table in an, a wrong way? <laughs> of course, I don't, none of you do. But I know people who do. I do. <clears throat> and so you could be angry with your spouse. You could be holding a grudge. You could be resentful. And yet you come and take communion. And God says, well, makes it pretty doggone clear that that puts you in a very risky, precarious position before God. Paul says some people die doing this. When I was in Africa for many years, it was fairly typical that less than half of the people would take communion on Sunday. And the reason they didn't is because they actually believed that people die who take it in an unworthy manner. Because that's what Paul said. And so they were afraid that they hadn't really reconciled with their brother or reconciled with their family or reconciled with a parent or a sibling or whatever it might be. Now, you can overstate that and you can thus make the standard so high that you're never quite sure if you really have completely reconciled because there's all of this doubt or whatever it might be. Uh, but that's not the intention, clearly. But the intention is that we're to keep short accounts with people so that we don't carry around grudges and resentments and anger and bitterness toward people uh, throughout the week. But rather we, we, we address those issues routinely and thus, because why? Because it's more important than taking communion is being reconciled to your brother, being reconciled to your uh, fellow believer, whoever that person might be. And so don't do the don't go to the altar until you've gotten your relationship with your brother right. Uh, now, whenever certain sins are said to be worse than others, <clears throat> or certain laws are said to be more important than others, we have to realize that the Bible is assigning different levels of priority uh, among the commands. So when one sin is seen as greater than another, it's telling us that there are certain priorities within the commands themselves. And so giving priority to one law over another is actually in accordance with the whole of the law and is not a conflict between particular laws. It's a matter of precedence or priority. 
Uh, and in the second place, biblical laws are also given with the implicit understanding that there are exceptions to rules. There are exceptions to rules. Uh, as you know, the, for example, in, in, in the Bible's legal system, it's assumed, for example, that in an emergency situation uh, uh, and under some unusual circumstances, uh, normal regulations may be transcended by more important principles, by more important principles. For example, uh, in the confrontation between the apostles and the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 5, uh, the Sanhedrin had commanded the apostles to stop preaching about Jesus, uh, but the apostles ignored the command. And they defended their action in chapter 5 verse 29 by saying, we must obey God rather than men. Uh, and so the overarching requirement of obeying God transcends that command to honor those in authority over you. So, uh, so if, if the state tells me I, I shouldn't do something, the state has a legitimate role. The scriptures make it clear that God has ordained those authorities to, in effect, create a broader uh, peace among people, which makes actually living the Christian life possible or easier. But that ordained role of the state or the government does not transcend God's ultimate uh, authority. Therefore, I might have to disobey a law to be faithful to God. And that, of course, uh, has happened a lot throughout the history of the church. So the law anticipates uh, that th these general principles will sometimes indicate contrary courses of action. They'll indicate contrary cor courses of action. In those cases, then, the right thing to do has to be discovered by looking at every command and principle and measuring the situation and motivations in light of every obligation. That's why there's nothing simple about living the Christian life. It isn't simple. It's extremely complicated because God demands absolute authority over our lives, which means He is examining every part of my life. Not only what you can see, but the things you can't see that only He can see. So living before Him is a fairly serious enterprise uh, for the Christian. Uh, and so we have to be now set on a course to look at all of it, not just the parts we like or the parts that seem most uh, the easiest to grasp. So the best course of action will be obedient to the entire body of the law in its full meaning, even if it doesn't resemble the way we usually apply some principles. Okay, so any questions about that, any of that, before we move forward? Any questions? I have, I have one question about um, one of the previous slides where you mentioned um, under the law. Because I was, I was, I think I, I, I understood what you meant, but uh -huh. where in the New Testament, I mean, in the New Testament, I have a sense that Christians are not viewed as under the law, for, like, for example, in Romans. So there is a sense in which Paul says, now, by the Spirit, we delight in the law. Uh -huh. We're not under the law, in, in, in a sense that Paul uses in uh -huh. the So can you clarify that under the law, under the law thing? Yeah, right. Of course, we're not under the law as a means of acceptance by God. In the Old Testament, that's all they had. And the purpose of the law was to show the impossibility of acceptance with God, even at your best effort. But nonetheless, you needed to know what the standards were because they were exhaustive. There was no part of your life that wasn't addressed by God. Whether it's the way you eat, whether you bathe, whether you... Everything. That's what's so tedious about the laws in the Old Testament. And you think, why was God so tedious about everything? Because... Our relationship to God is meant to be one of totality. That is, every part of us, inside and out, and every part of us, inside and out, is corrupted by sin. And therefore, in order for God to receive me and accept me, uh, I need 
perfection, which I cannot achieve. So the law, if you're under the law in the Old Covenant, you were living under the authority of the law as a means of acceptance before God. Whereas in the New Testament, we're no longer under the law. It's been now fulfilled by Christ. But that does not obviate our responsibility to keep the law. That's, you're exactly right. Paul says now, because of the Spirit, we can obey the law. We can now do it without achieving or seeking to achieve something through it. So I don't, I'm not obedient to God because I think my acceptance by God depends on that. My acceptance depends on Christ. But now I can be faithful and obey the law before God, uh, not as a means of salvation, but as a, a, a way of showing His power, His presence in my life. And the, he is who he says he is, and I can now be a person that I could never be without him. That's the whole point, I think, in Romans, that Paul, because so many people jump to the conclusion that therefore we should disregard the law. Like, it doesn't matter anymore. But that's a complete misunderstanding of what the law was designed to do and what Christ has fulfilled in the law. So now I'm freed up, and I can actually, that's the freedom in Christ is what? The freedom to obey. And it's the freedom to obey without a sense of my obedience determines the outcome of my eternal existence. The that freedom to be slaves of Christ. Yeah, exactly. Now no longer do I render my arms and my hands and my legs and my mind and my eyes to disobedience. I can now render them all to obedience to Christ, not as a way of achieving something, but rather simply as a way of demonstrating something, that I am a different person. Right. Okay. So, okay, so now let's look in, uh, at part five here, part five, the, the situational, we've been looking at the normative here, we want to go now look at the situational perspective, looking at revelation and our situation, revelation and our situation. So the first thing we want to do is consider the situational content of revelation and pay attention to what revelation teaches us about ethical situations. And then second, we want to look at the situational nature of Revelation uh, and especially look uh, concerning with nothing that God's revelation must be understood is within the context of its own situations. We need to note that. And then thirdly, look at some popular interpretive strategies toward Revelation, uh, looking at some ways that Christians have handled the situational character of Revelation. So, and fourth, turn to the application of that to our modern situation. So first, revelation in terms of the facts it presents to us. Second, the goals revelation obligates us to pursue. Third, the means revelation teaches us to use as we pursue those goals. And let's begin with the general facts that revelation presents to us. So if you're out there in the world and you know, and you read in the newspaper, or you're talking to your neighbor, or you're talking to your colleague at work, or you're talking to a colleague in school, or whatever. Uh, most of, most often, the first fact we ex we actually embrace is not the fact we ought to embrace first. And the, the fact we embrace first is usually something that throws itself in our our our, our path and in our way like some particular issue or question or controversy or something like that. But that's not the first fact we need to recognize. The first fact we need to recognize is God in the situation. The God is the primary fact. Okay, so everything is filtered through that. Everything is filtered through that. Uh, God Himself is the most basic fact that we learn through revelation. In other words, He is the ultimate ethical environment. He is the ultimate ethical environment. God doesn't come in later. He's there from the beginning. That's the thing we have to always remember. And the reality of His existence rules every ethical question. And it obligates me to live by the standard of His character. So His existence rules everything, every question that comes before me. He is the primary fact that I have to constantly address and be aware of. 
Through Revelation, God tells us facts about himself and facts about what he requires. If he didn't reveal himself that way, we would still, though, be bound to obey God, but we wouldn't know how. We wouldn't know how to obey God. Fortunately, not only does he reveal himself, and in doing so, he tells us not only that he's there, that he is the first and most important fact, he tells us how that is supposed to be taken into consideration, how we're supposed to respond. So if you think about your situation you face as, say, a citizen of a particular country, a citizen of a particular a country, the government is the authority of the land, uh, and the laws of the government are means through which the government exercises control, exercise control over its subjects or its citizens. And the government also exercises control in other ways, doesn't it? In other words, it has employees that carry out its bidding. Uh, it has maps that define the boundaries of the, of the state. It has treaties and uh, formal relationships with other countries. It has money. It has a, 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 a currency that it administers in the economy and so on. And all those are means by which the government exercises its authority and controls those things under its authority. Uh, or you could put it another way, the existence of the government is a fact in our legal situation. Its laws are additional facts that explain the kinds of duties I owe the government. And if we want to obey the government, those facts we need to know. We need to know. Well, in a similar way, God is the supreme authority over all of creation. So his authority is absolute, unlike the state. His authority is absolute. And his character uh, is the perfect expression of his will. So when he reveals his character, uh, that revelation is the means through which God exercises control, much like a human government exercises control through its laws. And just as human beings obey civil laws, because they bow to the government's authority, all creation must obey God's laws by bowing to His authority. So besides communicating the facts to us, uh, God's revelation also teaches us about a special set of facts that are particularly important for ethics. And those are the proper goals for Christian behavior and Christian decision making. So, when we speak of goals in ethics, when we th speak of goals in e ethics, what we have in mind is the expected outcome of our endeavors. The expected outcome of our endeavors. Uh, in most cases, our goals are rather complex, aren't they? So, for example, a carpenter uh, who measures and cuts wood for the purpose of building a house uh, when he does, his most immediate goals are to measure and cut accurately, unless I'm the carpenter, not measuring and cutting accurately. But his immediate goals are measuring and cutting accurately. What's the more distant goal? The construction of the house. So the immediate goal is to cut the wood and measure the wood accurately. The longer term goal is to construct a house. And Additionally, he's making money uh, to take care of his family. Now, if his actions are truly good, uh, his ultimate goal must, to be, must be to do it for the glory of God. You see, all those uh, subsidiary goals uh, are part of a larger goal which is meant to glorify God. And just as special, general, and existential revelation that we've talked about earlier each teach us important generic facts. Uh, each type of revelation also provides us with goals that we have to adopt in our Christian ethics. So in the first place, special revelation uh, does what? Special revelation gives us countless goals that have to be considered in our Christian ethics. Countless goals. To name only a few, Scripture teaches us the goals of doing good to our neighbors. 
uh, raising our children in Christ, striving for the unity of the church. Uh, but among the many goals that special revelation teaches us, it presents God's glory as the highest and the most important goal. So in 1 Corinthians 10, whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So general revelation, general revelation also identifies goals that are good and other goals that are evil. And like special revelation, it teaches us the greatest goal is to glorify and to thank God. Look at Romans 1, 20, 21. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So general revelation places an obligation on everybody to glorify God through what they see, and they obviously don't. So finally, you have existential revelation. Uh, it helps us to discern good goals from evil goals, especially how? Through the conscience, through the conscience. In the case of a believer, the Holy Spirit is a source of existential revelation. It moves within us so that we want to pursue goal, good goals and, and avoid evil goals. As Paul says in Philippians 2, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. So the Spirit is working in me and through me to accomplish His goal. And my goal needs to be His goal, which is to glorify Him in all things. So all three forms of revelation, special, general, and existential revelation, all of them teach us the goals that God approves of. What about the means? What about the means? Well, have, we've looked at the situational content, content of Revelation in terms of facts and goals. Uh, now we need to look at the means that God has revealed for us to use in the situation. Now, we all, maybe some of us are familiar with people like Machiavelli who wrote The Prince. And, uh, of course, Machiavelli is kind of the, the role model that almost every political leader in the world tries to emulate. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and frankly, uh, the, the, some things about Machiavelli, you go, well, I'd rather, rather have a little Machiavelli than something else. But Machiavelli, uh, his whole point, his whole objective was to maintain power. That was all it was about, maintaining power. And so whatever you had to do to maintain power it was decided that was acceptable. If lying is necessary to do so, if you lie to the country next door in order to maintain and, and, and accelerate your power, that's okay. Just lie to them. Tell them what you think they want to hear. It doesn't matter. The goal is power, is to get it, keep it, and expand your power. And that's a very Machiavellian way of looking at relationship situations among people. So, however, to answer a question in a biblical manner, uh, we not only need to know the facts and goals God has revealed, we also need to find the appropriate means uh, that God has revealed. Uh, because assessing facts and setting goals are things that influence our actions. Uh, but our actions themselves are the means we choose to accomplish our goals. The means we choose to accomplish our goals. And as everyone is aware, the Bible has a lot to say about those means, the things we choose to do. So what God has said about the means we choose is, very important, is a very important element, if you will, uh, of our decision-making process. Think about what James said in James 2. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of, you, one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? What good is it? In other words, wishing them well is not the same as a, a, a trying to take action relative to God's goal with that person. Uh, 
See, our actions uh, are, the, are the means that God uh, uh, has ordained or has not to achieve his ultimate goals, not my own goals. So James calls for his readers uh, to seek insights primarily from general and existential questions by asking things like, what means are available to me to help the poor? So that's a, a means in relationship. You know, sometimes you can sometimes you can choose the wrong means even though you have what you think is the right goal in mind. So you can actually hurt a poor person if you choose the wrong means of trying to alleviate the poor person's poverty. So it, it's a very, that, that, that's a very complicated thing, but those are the things we're talking about. That your goal might be to make sure they don't starve, but in the process, if you use the wrong means, you might create even more starvation in the person's life. So you have to figure out what's really going on here and what would be the appropriate means to achieve that objective to help the poor. Uh, we all, always have to remember that special revelation has a lot to teach us about the means we choose to accomplish those goals. And one of the ways, main ways scripture teaches us about the ethical means is by doing what? It gives us examples to follow. It gives us examples. So again, the more familiar you are with the Bible, the more the examples multiply that God has given to us to show us what that relationship between means and ends really is meant to look like and how we can go wrong in that relationship. So you find a lot of negative examples uh, of people who didn't do so well in the Bible, but then also we find a lot of positive examples of people who did understand God's Word and His norms and assess their circumstances and perform good actions to achieve good goals. So on the one hand, Paul draws attention to the negative examples in 1 Corinthians 10. You remember, he wrote, We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for, for us. But then on the other hand, he draws attention to positive examples. For example, in 1 Corinthians 11, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So the situational content of Revelation gives us facts, goals, means that are essential to making proper ethical decisions and choices. So if we make biblical decisions, we have to understand what God has revealed about these dimensions of our situation. Well, this also relates to the idea of the nature of the revelation itself because the situational nature of revelation is important. Because God's revelation comes to us embedded in our own situations. It's embedded in our own situations. And because of that, we need to consider questions like what are the circumstances for which, within which, God has revealed Himself? What are the circumstances for which and within which God revealed Himself? How does understanding that help me make good ethical choices? So, we've said this before, we'll repeat it again. General revelation affirms Scripture, but it can never reveal ethical norms that are not also revealed implicitly in Scripture. So, Scripture is ultimately the guide, the determiner of all these things. So, any contribution general revelation makes to our knowledge of duty is purely a clarification of what Scripture's already told us, at least implicitly. And the same thing is true of existential revelation. It affirms the teaching of Scripture and never teaches us any norm that's not already directly or implicitly taught by Scripture, sola scriptura. So first, we need to speak about the inspiration of Scripture itself, considering the facts, goals, and means surrounding the writing of Scripture. And then second, uh, look at the example that confirms the importance of understanding those facts, goals, and means that are involved in the inspiration of Scripture. And then, 
let's look then first at the inspiration of Scripture itself, the manner in which God moved human authors to create Scripture. Now, when we think of inspiration, it's very important that we get that right. Uh, scripture is divinely inspired human writing. Divinely inspired human writing. God did not uh, did, did not go around Paul. In other words, there's the theory of inspiration that's called mechanical dictation inspiration. And that's the idea that if you take Paul as your example, that Paul was somehow put into a trance and a quill pen was put in his hand and there was this, you know, we'll call it paper. Paper was there and Paul was just, and it's just, it's like his hand was moving around and he was writing all this stuff. And Paul's personality, his history, his experience, his emotions, none of that is comes through the writing of the text. And that's called mechanical or dictation theory of inspiration. That's not a biblical view of inspiration. Because what we have, rather, is the Spirit motivating and, if you will, controlling in the sense of not allowing Paul to say anything that wasn't true or not according to the truth uh, to ensure that everything was true, but it bears the mark of Paul, his personality. When you read Paul's letter to the Romans, you see a very highly disciplined legal mind. It's just there. And then you see, when you read Peter, you see someone who's not as formally educated as Paul, and who writes differently. His word, the choice of words is different than the kind of words Paul chose. And you see that throughout, like for example, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That John does not write like Luke does, and Luke doesn't write like Matthew or Mark. Uh, each one has his own personality, but the Spirit made sure that they did not write down error, that things were not true, but they each have that unique mark of their own personality. And that way, the Spirit keeps the author free from error, but also it preserves their personalities and their intentions and their writings. And as a result, the original meaning of Scripture is the meaning the divine and human authors of Scripture jointly intended to communicate. And that's not a, a composite meaning, as if the author intended to one thing and the Spirit intended something else, but rather it's a unified meaning in which the Holy Spirit and the human author intended the same thing. Now that doctrine of inspiration is described in lots of places in the Bible. But if you look at two texts in particular, uh, that demonstrate the contributions that both the spirit and the human writer make, I think it's helpful. So in the first place, look at the Holy Spirit's role as the author of Scripture in Peter, in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. It says, No prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's a really beautiful picture of being moved along by the Spirit. It wasn't the prophet's own ideas by themselves, but the Spirit leading the prophet to write down what God wanted him to write down, but in his own way, in his own unique style, in his own unique words. And so <clears throat> that leads to the question, then, well, how were the human authors involved? And in Matthew 22, you see this conversation between Jesus and some Pharisees who opposed him. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Well, the son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? And how can he be the son of David and the Lord of David at the same time? In other words, Jesus was so good at this. He says, For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? He you know, you don't want to debate with Jesus here uh, about the Bible. But anyway, uh, so uh, Jesus is re referring here to what? Psalm 110, verse 1. And at that point, what, uh, the point he was trying to make was to, uh, to uh, understand what the Holy Spirit meant in this verse. And to do that, it was first, you had to first know what David, that David in fact wrote it. This is David writing. And then second, 
what the original meaning David was trying to communicate by what he was writing. In other words, to understand the original meaning of any scripture, you have to learn a lot of things about its authors, their circumstances, their experiences, their education, their theology, and their priorities. And often our understanding of those things can be enhanced and enlarged uh, from information that comes outside the Bible, uh, such as historical, cultural, and linguistic facts. That's why it's a, not just one thing, it's lots of things that go into making us good students of the Bible. And beyond that, you have to pay attention to the goals the authors of Scripture had. What were their motives? What audiences did they hope would read their writings? What response did they want to elicit from the reader? And then you have to consider the means they employed, things like the language with which they wrote, or the genre of literature they used, the, their rhetorical techniques, the structure of their thoughts and their arguments. Uh, so, 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 this is hard, hard work and serious work for the student of Scripture. Uh, and so to conclude with that, to rely on Scripture in our ethics, we have to evaluate all of these facts we have to look at all of these goals. We have to look at all of these means in order to learn why the authors wrote what they did, the way they did, what they meant by what they wrote, and how their original audience would have understood what they wrote before we just start taking verses and throwing them around the room uh, to deal with a particular issue. So uh, an example that, uh, that gives us the, suggests the importance of this uh, is uh, found, for example, in 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, and we'll look at that when we come back from our break.